What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Lights Out. Today we are covering the Blackout Project. Blackout is one of those extreme haunts where you do have to sign a waiver. According to co-creator Josh Randall, he describes the Blackout experience as containing many different meanings and definitions. Blackout does allow physical contact fully. It involves psychological torture, sexual assault, nudity, and of course, fake blood. He dragged Meredith into a bright white room with three other people kneeling against the wall with bags over their heads. Then the man pressed a staple gun up against her face and pulled the trigger. Blackout inspired the hell out of me and I can't wait to dive back in. And I'm so grateful for the experience. If you're curious about it, I couldn't recommend it more. Go, go, go before they close. Light out, everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Lights Out. I'm your host, Josh, joined in the studio by the boys. We got Austin. Hey, how's it going, man? I'm good, man. And Daniel, what's up? What's up, guys? Today, we are covering the Blackout Project, an extreme immersive horror or extreme haunt that's is no longer active as far as we know, but it seems like they might be starting it back up. Potentially. Yeah, it hasn't. I mean, it hasn't like officially declared that it's done forever, but it has not been active, I think, since 2019, which kind of makes sense right before the pandemic and then yeah. just kind of shut down after that. But this is not your ordinary haunt. I mean, you guys were just at a haunted house this past uh, past weekend, right? Yeah. What was it called? The Frightmare Compound? Yeah, the Frightmare Compound in yeah. Colorado. Yeah, just and north of Denver. Were you, did you face your fears or was it? I'm a, <laughs> I'm a broken man. I, uh, I still had a great time. It was a lot of fun. And it's fun just to act scared. I mean, you don't want to like be the tough guy and act like a total douchebag. So. <laughs> like if the actors are trying and they're yeah. into it, I was like, whoa, you know, you kind of <laughs> act with along with them or else you're just a curmudgeon. I feel like but. Daniel doesn't, doesn't react at all. Probably. No, I do. I same, same thing along with Austin. I, you know, if the actors, I want the actors to have fun too, cause they are there all night. I'm so going to just act for the actor. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> you I, act I scared paid, for the actors. I paid to act for the actors. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna have fun with it. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna act tough going through a haunted house. I'm gonna have fun with it. I'm gonna suspend my belief. I'm gonna. I'm gonna have fun. All right. Yeah. All right. Did you guys have to sign a waiver? No. That's how you know it's not real if you don't have to sign a waiver, right? Right. So that's the difference between your average, you know, haunted attraction to blackout. Is blackout is one of those extreme haunts where you do have to sign a waiver because they will touch you. Oh and, yeah. And and do all sorts of different things. I mean, the most infamous one out there is obviously McCamey Manor, which we are planning to revisit here in the next couple of weeks because there was a, just a documentary release kind of exposing McCamey Manor uh, for what it is. And uh, I'm very interested to dive back into that. And we've, I've covered it here on this show a long time ago, but I thought it was a time to revisit it because, you know, more, more information has come to light. There's people who claim abuse and, uh, you know, if you know anything about Russ McCamey, he uh, he takes it to a whole nother level. Uh, probably a, as a shock to no one that yeah. there's like an expose of abuse <laughs> yeah, on that exactly. place. You know, whereas the Blackout Project or Blackout is very different from many of these other extreme haunts, including McCamey Manor, because it's it's truly a unique experience for every single person that goes through it, and the creators of it, as you'll as you'll find out really kind of call this more of like an immersive art experience but more along the psychosexual horror experience is what they call it exactly. so it's kind of playing more into that realm yeah it plays more into real life fears than monster paranormal right fears, stuff like that right so what's interesting to me about it is i don't think i would ever go through this and you know i'll ask you guys at the end if you would but there's a there's many different reasons for that according to co-creator josh randall in his own words he describes a blackout experience as containing many different meanings and definitions in 2009 he created the experience with christian thor 
his good friend and work partner for many years. And to them, the traditional haunted house just wasn't scary enough. They wanted to bend the genre and create something more immersive and unforgettable. And they understood that to achieve the highest levels of fear possible, they needed to personally curate the experience for adults. In the off-season, Blackout was a small invite-only event, usually only involving one person at a time, which set it apart from the typical group shows at haunted houses. Because, I mean, you go to any haunted house, they put you through in groups. Yep. Yeah. And that makes it way less scary, to be honest. It, it really you know, does. you got your buddies behind you. If It's, you know. Nothing can be that scary when you're goofing and gaffing with your with your bros, right? Well, and I think you, there's this inherent sense of like safety in numbers too. Oh yeah. So definitely. like even if you are starting to feel immersed in the experience, you know there's like people behind you and yeah. you know usually you're kind of like walking through the dark or whatever with a hand on each other. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, and if you bring bring your significant others and you know in our our case our our, our women with us, you know, we're kind of focused on them too at the same time you know you're kind of like it's hard to fully immerse yourself because you're wondering how they're doing, they're doing yeah because exactly. usually like at least our women are a little bit more scared i don't know i don't know about your girlfriend oh yeah she's gets uh, terrified like even when we watch it's more paranormal stuff that she gets scared of but she refuses to go to haunted houses and uh even when we're watching paranormal paranormal movies she has to like she does the little kid thing where she has to close her eyes and like <laughs> barely peek out like that. So yeah, she's she's not about it. But she does. I, I kind of got her into more horror stuff. Oh, lately. really? Yeah. What about you, Danny? Is is Annalie into horror as all that much? Annalie's specifically really into like Korean horror. She really oh, wow. loves it. Yeah. Interesting. But for haunted houses, I mean she has a lot of fun, but every time we go to a haunted house, the staff just bully her like they, they focus on her and not me and like i get it like yeah if, if i, I can was an, see that yeah if i was an actor in like a haunted house and i was either gonna scare you know me or you know my little five foot two girlfriend they'd probably go for the girlfriend it makes i sense. hate that they do that yeah because i, I get why but it kind of takes away like it takes more talent to scare the big big buff guy right yeah. and you know, the, the, the girl that's with them. I think my problem too, is that they see me and I'm like laughing that's and smiling through it. That's so how they're I, like, that's how um, I am too. They're like, we're not, we're, we'd rather go for the person who's already scared and scare them more than try to scare the guy with the smile on his face. So I get it, I guess. I think the hard thing is that with the traditional haunts is that we're also desensitized to a lot of the things that they do that it just doesn't phase us anymore i mean we've all like especially horror fans i mean we watch so many different movies and content that we're just like we've seen it all at this point point. and to recreate what horror movies are doing is very difficult in a haunt uh, a typical haunt and so these extreme haunts really came about because they're like people aren't getting scared they're not actually fearful in these attractions anymore so how do we take it to the next level to where they're actually facing their fears and obviously isolating your isolating you is the first way to do that yeah and that's why that like i really appreciate josh randall's philosophy on this um he even said in in 2011 this was early on they started in 2009 by 2011 he he kind of explained his philosophy and what they were trying to achieve he says quote our goal is to elicit real fear and so we do research on real life situations so we can connect with the most amount of people. Although people tend to have fun and get a kick out of vampires, monsters, etc., generally those kinds of scares do not place people in a state where they believe their life is truly in danger. But being mugged, raped, tortured, etc., these are real life scares that take the fun, quote fun, out of being scared and push people into a place of genuine fear. If we can make someone forget that they paid for this and make them actually question whether or not they will really get hurt, we've done our job. The majority of the decisions we make in life are made to keep us safe and keep us out of harm's way. Trying to bypass that and push people into genuinely frightening situations is our aim. For that to happen, we need to understand the psychology of fear and how to manipulate it to our advantage. So a lot of... Whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. What the hell? Here we go. All right. Happy Halloween, everybody. <laughs> yeah. That was weird. 
All right, we're back after a minor technical difficulty, as uh, as usually happens uh, here at Lights Out, and always specifically to my mic. I don't know why yours never I think fucks I'm, up. But I'm protected by the Holy Spirit. Over here or <laughs> you said your prayers this morning. Yeah. I I forgot. So <laughs> the devil is uh, playing with me. But blackout. So before we really dive into blackout, and, and we're going to go through some different experiences. We're going to go through kind of the thought behind it a little bit more. I want you to see one of their trailers that they made for for this experience back in 2016, because this will really, I think, help set the tone for today's episode. Let's roll it. There is flashing lights, so if you need to look away, definitely do it now. No idea what that is. Jay. <laughs> also, I don't know if we mentioned this is 18 and up. I don't know if we mentioned that. Adults yeah. only for, for this. Yeah. This is a, you do not send your kid through this one. No. Uh love the production value on that trailer though. Um also, how did they make Ode to Joy so terrifying? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it was like Wait. Ode to Fear, I guess. I mean, just from those clips, you can just see how uh, distressing it is. Yes. And yeah. intense. Yeah. I mean, it's just taking it to a whole nother level. And those disturbing, we'll, we'll get into those, what, whatever they're showing in that. You it's something of, that they use quite a bit is just disturbing imagery and like, mm -hmm. I, like they'll do medical experiments and stuff like that. I couldn't even tell what that was. I, I hope that's some kind of animal. Yeah. <laughs> it looked like a pig. Yeah. Okay. It, was, it did kind of look like a pig. Yeah, what, I were they, I saw, what were they pulling out of it? probably part of it <laughs> okay it's just like a, a no. butcher butcher video yeah so blackout symbol is the ellipsis which they often fake tattoo on customers bodies during the show sometimes on their necks or heads according to an old blackout instagram post they explain why they chose the ellipsis quote it signifies silence a lapse or pause or textual omission of some kind but for this last purpose, the marks became the tool of the censor. But authors can work censorship creatively for their own means. What can't be said can be hinted at, and a well-placed ellipsis can itself convey something risque, frisky, or downright sordid. Over the years, they've experimented with almost every kind of realistic immersive horror. They've used virtual reality, remote phone experiences, personal home invasions even large-scale haunted house collaborations, and some convention and festival pop-ups. But the most common experiences are individual experiences, but there have also been rare group shows during some seasons. Blackout does allow physical contact fully, simulated rape, nudity, and of course fake blood. It involves psychological torture, sexual assault, coercion, and graphic images. From the beginning, it was designed to be controversial. The original idea was to make something indismissible and stay with you for a long time. Which is like, that, that's the part for me that I really struggle with is like, would I want to go through something that's going to leave me fucked up for a long time? Yeah, the goal, they're just expressing that their goal is to make sure it sticks with you. I would be, I'd possible. be worried about PTSD. Yeah. Something like this. Honestly, genuinely. The creators see it as a form of art. Like projecting fears onto a canvas, which uh, I kind of love that definition. <laughs> yeah, same. And they hope that the people who responded to it in a positive way also learned something from it. Of course, most people respond in a negative way, but they have had some people go through who literally feel like it's changed them for the better. Yeah, and they 
they will see later they get kind of addicted to the experience because they it's, think uh, they're, it's, they're using it as almost like a therapy session a little bit, you know? So Josh and Chris have been the core creative team of Blackout since it was first created in 2009. Josh had already managed a theater on the west side of Manhattan at the time, so he decided to shut it down for four weeks in the summer and try out the Blackout experience for the first time. It was originally called the Midsummer Nightmare at the Haunted House Vortex Theater. And the goal from the beginning was to prioritize a strong, terrifying environment. From early on, it was meant to be psychological, sexual, and just downright disturbing. There were things like a giant dildo props and a man with snakes coming out of his butthole. Perfect. <laughs> Amazing. But the hardest part was understanding the audience level of fear because Josh and Chris usually couldn't see their reactions in real time. They had to understand how the audience felt through social media and word of mouth after the fact to curate the experience even more. According to Josh, Blackout has always been a polarizing experience, and there's about as much negative feedback as there is positive feedback. They're actually on Yelp. So if you're interested and want to read through a bunch of reviews, I'll just tell you right now, that's like 2.4 average. Yeah. Oh, almost dead center between one and five, you know, or yeah. zero and five. Which I think that, that tells you something. There has also been cases of people being upset and demanding their money back. But days later, they would send an email saying that the experience pushed their buttons and did exactly what it was supposed to do. During the Halloween season, the blackout experience was a 25-minute walkthrough. Usually a few thousand people attended each year, hoping to experience something more adult and more disturbing than the typical haunted house for teenagers. With that being said, I just want to play a few clips from some of their rehearsal footage in their early years. So this is before, this is like 2009, 2010. Fear just doesn't come from that. Real fear comes from from something that's like so this is Chris. real in front that's of Chris, you, yep. and that has an equal. There, there's an equal relationship between how much you're pushing at them and how much they need to come to you. Here we go. Oh man. Ready. On the bed. On the bed. To you, like they have a, a great time afterwards, you know what I mean? And they feel afterwards. You know, yeah, right. They're like, thank God I'm out of here. For me is when they this is Josh. So yep. disoriented. And they literally this look this look on their eyes of like what I, I don't even know what just happened. Because it is not what they're expecting. Because they're it's called a haunted house. They think it's a haunted house, and they're like vampires. <laughs> you know, <laughs> is I'm the guy who sends them off the first long dark hallway. They turn the first corner and they see the darkness. I mean, and I, I we'll turn off the lights. It gets dark. I mean, like, no fucking around. It, I've literally seen grown men like reduced to like oh my god <laughs> our goal is to create a sensation and an environment yeah. and to sustain that and it's that that is scary to people and the sort of the ah, i'm gonna eat your insides or whatever um we're never gonna be able to say anything to anyone that's gonna actually make them be like oh no maybe they will eat my insides <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's the intensity it's the eyes it's the mystery it's it's gener generally not the it's just it's not the narrative it's like it's the it's the fiction that we that you create as an audience when we're going through it much more than it's the fiction that we we offer you a lot of opportunities to have your mind go in lots of directions i guess is the way to say that and we want to be sure not to pop that bubble I wonder if those the actors were maybe I know they're in New York so I wonder if they're like theater students or something along those lines because just the look in that lady's eyes that she seemed like she was really getting into character there where just at the last haunted house I mean some people are having fun and they're really into it but it kind of seems like they're just like seasonal people that swing by yeah i think that's the there. difference and it's also like how many times 
you know, it probably gets exhausting to like do the same thing over for right. hours on end every night. But a and, trained actor is known but, to do right, multiple takes. Right. right. Yeah. And I think that's what makes this work is that they do have to have top level actors to be able to truly make the person going through it believe what they're seeing and not break character. Yeah. And I mean, you can just tell from that, that short clip that they, they are in character and they take it very seriously. Yeah. And that was just rehearsals. Too. Yeah. That's just that a rehearsal the thing. Right. Yeah. Right. So on the off season, so not around Halloween, the more intense invite only sessions began. You could only get an invite depending on your fan status and how many times you had been to the show. Only a few dozen people usually got to experience this in each location each year. And there was an overwhelmingly positive response. By the next season, they focused more on the personalized horror experience of the Midsummer Nightmare show, and they eventually moved it out of the theater and into the quote unquote real world. Their new location was a hotel room that people had to check into. It also involved a phone booth just outside the hotel where they would get a burner phone and sign a detailed waiver. Once they realized that they didn't have to perform the show through an isolated maze like a typical haunted house, it really opened up the blackout experience to so much more. I mean, sky's the limit. And that's when they also began experimenting with physical touching, which soon became a selling point. In the early days, the touching was very light, and the first shows involved only touching people with feathers. But as time went on, it became much more aggressive. By 2011, they were tying people's hands behind their backs. Josh claimed that at first that it never had anything to do with bondage or S&M or pain. It was more about the psychological threat of violence and danger. These off seasons became these new experimental grounds for new fear tactics that they wanted to try out. And they advised everyone, you're not, do not participate if you have epilepsy, if you have experienced a near drowning event or any form of sexual abuse. They do not advise that you go into this for good reason. Um, they have rooms with naked people chained to the floor, simulated sexual assault between actors and sometimes, you know, against you. Sometimes the actors grind on you over your clothes. So occasionally they'll throw a light punch at you, things like that. They'll grab you, force you into chairs and stuff like that. Sometimes you get choked, suffocated with a plastic bag or Ugh. even waterboarded, which is insane. Yeah, fuck that. <laughs> yeah, right? I'm not trying to get waterboarded. A lot of the experiences are super disorienting because they force you to sit in a dark room before it starts. And then they used to uh, blind you with a flashlight before throwing you into the next room, or they would just start strobe lights at you after sitting in a dark room for a while. Plus, if you're afraid of gore, we just saw in that teaser, you know, nobody knows. Sometimes it's hard to discern what you're looking at, but they've done, they've showed like medical uh, treatments on animals of surgeries and stuff like that. So if that makes you queasy, they advise people not to go into it. They also began forcing people. This was at the end of their early shows. And this is kind of what got them super popular. They began forcing people to pull tampons out of like a medical, like mental asylum patients at the end. Oh. So you would pull a used tampon out of them and then you were forced, they would order you to put the tampon in your mouth and oh. suck on it. And of course, it looked bloody. As far as I know, it was just some sort of juice. Or Some people said it tasted like juice. Other reports I saw, it actually tasted like irony. Like it was oh. actually blood. So not sure what exactly was on it. But uh, the illusion of something being real, that was what they, they wanted to get out of this blackout experience. So that's what they built on. And by 2012, Blackout made it to the Trans World's Halloween and Attraction Show convention. All they had was a TV playing disturbing surgery videos and a woman silently lying on the floor or sitting in a chair looking disturbed in silence for eight hours. The show's popularity grew even more, and that year they expanded to Los Angeles. The show was only $50 and promised some of the most genuine scares in a simulated horror experience. As their popularity grew, they knew that safety was a priority, unlike... Uh, Someone else we know, <laughs> Mr. Russ McCamey. So as you're probably wondering, you know, this, this experience is similar in some ways to McCamey Manor, but it's uh, much safer to go through the McCamey Manor. And so here is a clip of Josh actually being asked about safe words 
and uh, kind of what his thoughts are on Russ McKamey and his haunt. Let's take a look. So in regards to that, so talking about safety, when you're sitting next to Russ McKamey on a panel, <laughs> and he starts giggling at the idea of safe words and consent, yes. and what goes through your mind? What do you think about that? Um, just by a show of hands, who knows what McKamey Manor is? Yeah. Okay, so most everyone. For those of you that don't, it's a haunted house that was basically started in San Diego almost 20 years ago, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And it, it was sort of a home haunt. He would do it in his, his garage. He was sort of blackout before blackout was blackout. Uh, super extreme. Um, the difference is that uh, he doesn't believe in safe words. His experiences can last upwards That's of crazy. six to eight hours uh, per person. Um, six to eight hours. Ability. You don't have to pay to go through it. The only payment you have to do is allow him to fill you um, going through this experience and uh, I've personally sat on many panels with Russ um, and he's a very controversial figure within this world uh, and the question was I guess how do I personally feel sitting next to him as he giggles about consent I have a hard time with it um, you know for us this is a job um, it's it's definitely a piece of art but it's something that we want to bring to people our goal is not to hurt people um, somehow we stumbled on blackout with blackout we stumbled on something where people were having these negative but also really positive experiences so for us it was about tightening that and really trying to tune into it um, within a safe way. I think um, the difference is, is that Russ is potentially a little bit more of like a, a, a bona fide horror fan. Um, and I, I, I sense is a little bit more interested in eliciting a very specific response out of his audience members. <laughs> Um, and from a legal and moral point of view, uh, many people could argue that, uh, that that's maybe not a good thing. Um, I personally would never do McKinney Manor. Um, I, I hope most people would read enough stuff that they would not do McKinney Manor um, because it just seems very unsafe and there's a lot of um, precedent and track record of that being documented. I like how he pointed out, he said moral, but he also prefaced it, he said legal and moral. And I think that's a great point because it's like, if they wanted to bring this to more people and have these theaters and, and do these events, I'm assuming they have probably at least one lawyer to make sure that these waivers are very clear, that everyone's safe, that there's no litigation possible against blackout because yeah, it would ruin the whole thing. You just get shut down and no one would get to experience it so somehow russ hasn't been shut down yes. so that's the that's a big question there. is he still running that do you know yeah he i believe is. he is actually um i don't know if like as recent as this year or last year but like definitely 2020 i think his website's still up and active okay and stuff but yeah I'm, I'm interested to to take a look at that documentary and see see what that's about because there's clearly more to the story there and I mean, just a number of people have come forward after that. I mean, you, I, I think the difference is, and what's interesting is there's not a lot of, at least that I could find like a ton of people talking publicly about blackout, like on YouTube, but like, because Russ films, everybody that goes through, there's all this evidence of like, what's going what, on, what's there. going on. Yeah. And just the, the reactions of people coming out of McKamey Manor just seems like. I don't know, like next level more the, the fear they experience and trauma they experience was like so real that many of those people are shaking and yeah. just look like fucked up. Yeah. Like they just went through something horrific versus this there. There's some of that, like in, in the reviews that you'll see, and, and we'll kind of talk more about this later, but there's definitely, I, I think I, one thing I do want to say is that everything you've heard from Josh and Chris, the creators, really paints it in a good light like they're yeah. really painting this experience like this is safe this is you know we're not like mckamey manor because you know we have safe words russ doesn't believe in safe words which i think safe words are are necessary for for this type of experience but i will tell you that there are a number of people who've come out of blackout with very negative experiences including people who have experienced physical pain that lingers injuries, things like that, that happen as a result of this. So of course, like you know, on these panels and stuff, he's painting blackout in a very 
good yeah, light because it's PR. You know, it's PR. They want people to go to it, but not the reviews, the reviews speak for themselves. I mean, a lot of people got fucked up in this experience. Yeah. So uh, you know, some of you might be like, "Oh, this is nothing compared to McCamey Manor." You know what I mean? And and it's different, very different. It's not just like I, I think he explained it very accurately. Like McCamey Manor and Russ is focused on that like true horror aspect and yeah. just like pushing the limits is literally as far yeah torture yeah. torture is at the forefront of mckinney manor blackout has some of that but it's also a cycle psycho- it's more psychological like yeah. fucking with you mm-hmm. than it is physically fucking with you. right yeah and i i appreciate that more because i feel like with those limitations of not just being able to assault people and and scrap safe words they have to work with the, in those limitations and i think that curates the experience even more because they realize like okay if we're gonna have safe words if we're not gonna push the physical assault as far as mckamey manor does how do we psychologically get to the root of fear and so i think they've maybe even i would argue they almost up the ante compared to mckamey manor just just as far as the psychological horror goes right right i i would i would i would agree with that and i think the other thing you have to remember too is like Russ is there the whole time, <laughs> yeah, which is no so weirdo. bizarre. Yeah. Filming you, yeah. Whereas this is there is like virtually no footage of people's experiences in blackout because it's yeah. all very personalized, and they purposely didn't allow the experiences to be filmed because they want to keep it very secret and mysterious. And there is a documentary called "The Blackout Experiments" on Prime Video uh, that actually ended up going to Sundance uh, Film Festival, but that was the only time that they let documentary filmmakers come in and kind of film. And even then they didn't film like a whole bunch, but there is some like, they did film a couple uh, members go through it yeah. and you can kind of get a much better sense of what it's like. And it's it's hard to like talk about it and do it justice, but when you watch it, you're like, damn, this is pretty, pretty intense experience yeah. that these people go through. No, seriously. So here's a list of rules for one of the seasons for blackout. Um, you know, obviously rules are necessary for many different reasons, safety, legality. So here's what those rules were. You must walk through alone. You must be over 18. You must follow all directions at all times. Stay on the marked path at all times. Do not ever touch an actor unless you are instructed to do so. Do not ever speak unless you are instructed to do so. Don't ever touch the walls. You will be prompted to do certain actions. Do exactly as you're told. This is for your safety. You must wear a protective mask. The safety word is safety. If you have an emergency while walking through and need to be escorted out, please yell the word safety as loud as you can. Stay exactly where you are. Remain calm and someone will come get you and bring you out. If there is an action you absolutely will not do, please yell the word safety as loud as you can. Stay exactly where you are, remain calm, and someone will come and get you and bring you out. No, you cannot skip that part, but still continue. (laughs) So there's no skipping things. You have to go through it as they lay it out for you. And once safety has been called, there are no refunds and there are no other options but to leave. So in one of the promo videos for their 2012 Halloween show, you can actually hear a woman yelling safety in the background. I love how they use that as marketing. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> like, safety. Yeah. Because, that I mean, that's their goal, right? They're kind of trying to get you to say safety, right? Yeah. They're trying to, to break you in that way. So while you go through blackout, you'll encounter a lot of different things. Fog, strobe lights, loud sounds, complete darkness, crawling, kneeling, stairs, mild restraints, water, sexual and violent situations, and aggressive physical touch. All patrons are required to read the rules and sign the waiver on site before entering. This is not optional. If there are any rules you do not follow, you will immediately be required to leave. And of course, there are no refunds. So that's another difference between Blackout and McCamey Manor is you do have to pay uh, to enter the Blackout experience. Whereas McCamey Manor, somehow he does the shit for free. And, you know, there's a lot of different uh, theories out there. Yeah, you can kind of think about why, right? Yeah. But here was an earlier 2012 show. And this is, we'll we'll be going through two shows. but you'll see how the earlier shows are a little bit more tame compared to the much later shows. 
Um, but this is from Meredith Warner on Gizmodo. She wrote about her experience of the 2012 show. And I believe this was a seasonal show, one of the Halloween ones. So in the beginning, each participant was given a surgical mask and they were told to put it on and never take it off. They were placed, I think it was a group of three in a pitch black room that slowly filled with fog. And then after a while, a strobe light began flashing in their eyes, making it almost impossible to see anything. If you've ever been in a room filled with fog and there's a light on, it's, you can't see beyond a few inches from your face. Right? I hate strobe lights. Oh, do you? They, they, I like them, but I hate them. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's like, fair they enough. make sense for haunts. And I think, it is so disorienting yeah. to be, walk through a strobe light because you kind of feel like you're walking through slow motion and then yes. things are kind of like ghosting around you. Yeah, so it's, it's like a, the frame rate has dropped, basically. Yep. Uh, strangers then appear through the fog, grab people, picking them out one by one. Um, then a stranger grabbed her by the elbow, tossed her into a dark room. They then thrust her up against a wall while she was still disoriented by the flashing lights and the fog. And while she was up against the concrete, they ordered her to grab a string that ran along the wall and follow it. But she's still half blind and disoriented from the strobe lights. She follows the string and then random hands began grabbing her on the neck and her head as she moved through this hallway. When she reached the end of the string, more hands appeared on her back and wrist. She was then pushed up against an opposite wall and groped by several more hands before being forced into a chair. While still disoriented, they then rolled up her one of her pant legs and put something freezing cold on her skin while dragging it up and down her shin bone. Other strangers pulled at her hair and blew on her neck. Another stranger was underneath her chair, grabbing at her legs. After the fondling was over, she was ordered to crawl through a small tunnel in the ground while being chased by a stranger from behind. At the end of the tunnel, the person chasing her then grabbed her forced her to lie on her stomach and then straddled her ass. And then they bent down and in a Southern accent, the stranger whispered that Meredith was pretty and they had all kinds of fun ready ahead. After being given an option of staying there or running away, she obviously said she wanted to run. So the stranger got off of her, let her go, and she sprinted towards a possible exit with a light. It was basically the only way to go. Beyond that was a set of stairs, and as she looked down at the bottom of the stairs stood a young woman in a hospital gown. She blocked the way down and began screaming and waving her hands as she got closer. When Meredith considered retreating back up the stairs, she turned around but noticed that a woman was blocking the way up as well. So both the women then grabbed her, dragged her down the stairs, and threw her in an old dentist chair. Both women then began cooing and petting her before one of the women reached under her own medical gown, began rubbing her crotch, and then revealed her hand that was covered in what seemed like period blood. She then took her bloody fingers and painted over Meredith's surgical mask while groping her hair and giggling. They also removed one of her shoes and socks, and the two strange women began fighting over who got the shoe. Someone then came from behind Meredith, snuck up, placed noise-canceling headphones over her head, and the two women disappeared in the darkness. From behind Meredith, a large man appeared in a ski mask. He dragged Meredith into a bright white room with three other people kneeling against the wall with bags over their heads like they were hostages or something. Meredith was pushed into a corner and commanded to kneel with the others. Her hands were then tied behind her back and they placed a bag over her head. She was then ordered to kneel there for several minutes. I think she said it felt like it was up to seven minutes. And she, you know, you're struggling. She's trying to undo the ropes because she's still tied up. But before they could come undone, someone then grabbed her by the arms, lifted her off the floor. In another room, she was then shoved into and set free from the wrist ties. And a man who she said looked exactly like Rob Zombie. Of course. <laughs> stood in front of her. Then the man pressed a staple gun up against her face and pulled the trigger. If you've ever shot a staple yeah. gun, you, know, you can hear the pop. So the pop goes off, but, you know, obviously there's not actual staples in there. They're not going to staple people, but still that pop is pretty loud and aggressive, especially if it's up against your head, I can imagine. Then another stranger tossed her out of the room and into a hallway of televisions. 
she was kind of distracted by these TV screens because they showed her walking down the hallway she was currently in, like it was CCTV security footage of her walking. And she almost didn't realize that there were things squishing beneath her feet. And as she looked down, she was walking on cold, wet condoms, like, like used condoms, basically. Eventually, she got through the end of the hallway and into another room, which she called, quote, the biggest mindfuck room of all. She drew back a curtain and someone ordered her to stand on the X on the floor. She didn't know where the voice was coming from, but she did as she was told. And she noticed a dirty mattress on the floor across from her. You can imagine that's super dark. So she's kind of pulling these things together slowly as her eyes are kind of adjusting to the darkness. She knows that the entire floor was covered in shoes and used condoms. And she was so distracted by all of it that she almost didn't realize that on the dirty mattress on the floor was a naked girl and she wasn't moving. And she kind of thought, you know, she appeared to be dead. And then she realized that in one of the other dark corners of the room, there was a naked skinny man uh, just staring at the wall in the corner. He was, oh. he was hunched over like he had been injured maybe. And when the man turned around and looked at her, this is as Meredith puts it in all caps, he had his quote, full dong out oh, man. and he began walking towards her uh, and I know in other versions of this I read another one where sometimes you'll enter this room and the man is just is having sex with a woman oh, on the wow. mattress and then he leaves and it just she just slumps over like she's dead or something oh wow Meredith said by that point quote I could actually hear my own insides rattling around inside my skull at the sheer confusion of the condom parade naked basement man. <laughs> God. once he got close enough to her she realized that he was holding her shoe that the strange woman had stolen earlier uh, the naked man then ordered her on the bed and after some hesitation she ended up sitting down on it next to the naked woman who wasn't moving the man even though she you know she wasn't listening to what he said and one of the rules is always listen to your orders so the man actually just grabbed meredith by the legs kind of yanked her physically forced her to lie down on her back and after a moment she noticed that the the lifeless naked girl next to her began to stir she began to she began kind of wiggling and then she she rolled over and started saying help me help me help me help me meanwhile the naked man took meredith's foot and began rubbing it all over his face so you can see how the narrative kind of pulls together too which i kind of like the shoe narrative right. you're like why did they take my shoe it's because this weirdo has a foot fetish right? <laughs> and this is kind of the the climax of it after what felt like an eternity the naked man threw her shoe at her forced her to get out of the room after she sprinted out she headed up some stairs and saw someone that looked like a staff member they told her to go to the bathroom put her shoes on, wash her hands, and head out. But as she walked towards the bathroom, someone, bam, a slam. They came barreling out of the bathroom door. They chased her all the way out of the building. And that's that the was, end of her experience, huh? Yeah, that was the end of the 2012 seasonal blackout experience. So this is like a 25-minute experience, it seems like. It seems like it would be Like a half track, hour or so Yeah, to go through all this. We've all been there turning to the internet to self-diagnose inexplicable pains, debilitating body aches, sudden fevers, and strange rashes. Though our minds spiral to the worst case scenarios, it's usually nothing. But for an unlucky few, these symptoms can start the clock ticking on a terrifying medical mystery. Mr. Ballin, one of the internet's most popular storytellers and host of the Mr. Ballin podcast, a fellow homie, he turns to the human body for an all new suspense driven podcast, Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries. Every episode of Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries recounts someone's living nightmare, like the unexplainable death of a retired firefighter whose body was reduced to ashes, even though nothing around him burned, or the time when an entire town became ill with nausea and chills. The local doctor initially chalked it up to being food poisoning until people started jumping from buildings and seeing tigers on their ceilings. Each terrifying true story will be sure 
to keep you up at night. Follow Mr. Bollin's Medical Mysteries wherever you get your podcasts. Prime members can listen early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Check out Mr. Bollin's Medical Mysteries today. So in 2013, they introduced their Blackout Elements show where they pushed the boundaries of a choose-your-own-adventure style. Two options were given in each situation, and every choice had high-stakes consequences. By 2014, they introduced Blackout House, which put people in groups for the first time like a traditional haunt, but the experience had mixed reception. The next year, they expanded to San Francisco, which integrated detailed movie sets into the experience, and they also added certain escape room elements. They also started doing personal house visits, where they curated experiences in people's homes. I think to me, that would probably be one of the most terrifying. And I don't, I, would that change your home forever? Like yeah. if you went through that in your own house? Well, that's what they kind of wanted. Yeah. They, like I remember there was an interview with Josh and he's like, I like this idea where you're just sitting at home and you think someone's out there, like beyond the window in the, in the darkness that you can't see. So he kind of built on that idea for the in-home experiences. Probably, probably a lot more terrifying than, you know, going to a, you know, building that, you know, is this haunt. Yeah. Versus and it's like, just a straightforward, you go into a few rooms and stuff. Yeah. Versus having people show up at your house unexpected. <laughs> I think this, that's really what sets blackout apart from other experiences. Yeah. These true. home experiences, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, they just, they're so curated and they just dig into people's fears because they're, they, you're they in get your to safe know you. space yeah, too. Yeah. yeah, you know your house is your safe space. It's so have, violating. Yeah, man. This is around when Blackout Twenty One began, which was a personalized show that continued until 2019. Each experience was a piece of the 21 chapters of a horror narrative. They began using their tagline, "quote It's never over," more literally, and they wanted to integrate the manufactured horror in people's everyday lives. Their signature became the three knocks, like the three dots of an ellipsis on people's front door and they played into the fear of strangers watching you outside your home in the middle of the night which come on i think that's like everybody's fear everybody <laughs> has that fear at some point right, in their life yeah. of like whether you're home or somewhere else and you know just feeling like there's somebody out there watching you and everyone's been out of the house lately for me just a little side story and i haven't lived at home alone for a while now because i've always had roommates and stuff i like having people in the house but now that I have Jerry and it's just me and Jerry, late at night, it'll be like 10 p.m., 11 p.m., she'll bark at the door, just start barking. And I'm like, who's who could it, put? the blinds are closed and everything, and the front door is locked. But, and I'm like, is she hearing something that I'm not? Because she never barks at random stuff. Okay, she she's only, not a random barker. No, she will only bark, and she's good. She's trained to only bark a few times, and then she stops. But she only barks when there are legitimately people at the door. So it's, oh, shit. it's got me concerned that there are people got rolling some up prowlers in house. out there. Yeah. Damn. No. Might just be drunk college kids. Yeah, though. I, I do that's live true. close to the university. <laughs> so this intense experience soon inspired a feature documentary, which I mentioned earlier in 2016, the Blackout experience premiered at Sundance and it featured customers of Blackout who became obsessed with the personalized Blackout experience. So this movie is, I mean, this is really where we get to see the only footage of these experiences um, firsthand. Um, I mean, there's the part where, you know, I don't want to spoil too much if someone's going to watch it, but there's a point with raw chicken and they're like forcing people to shove their hands in raw chickens, but I think they're blindfolded so they don't know what they're shoving their hand into exactly. I wonder if they microwaved the chicken beforehand and got a little warm or yeah, something. I'm not yeah. sure. Salmonella, man. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, I think the the most interesting thing about this film is that the two people that they follow closely through this are two guys that I just would never suspect of wanting to go through this. So like, what, 40s, maybe 50s yeah, the, even? They're older gentlemen for sure. Russell Eaton and Bob Globerman. Um, which I realized the one guy who his his wife is a therapist, yeah, right? I'm like what? Uh, he's an, actually an actor. He's been in some TV shows. Oh, I really? looked him up and I was like, I, this. He's been in some random TV shows throughout the years, but 
Yeah, those two guys, especially Russell, which I feel like the documentary kind of focuses yeah, on did. Russell a lot more. He was on that panel uh, clip that you saw earlier. Yeah. He's kind of like, what's interesting about Russell is he's been through this blackout experience, I think four, five times, like at least a few. And in the documentary, it, it all kind of comes to a head with him. And I don't want to give away what happens because... I do think if you're interested in in looking into this further, you should definitely watch it because it it does show a lot more than what we're able to. Unfortunately, it's copyrighted, so otherwise we would have clipped some of it in here. But it, it shows kind of a different side that we're not even really able to explain with words on what this experience is like for people and what it does to them psychologically. And it seems like for some of them, it seems like the the minority, I would say, become obsessed or almost addicted to it and they just want it again and again and again yeah even russell i think it was russell that said he's like he said something along the lines of like this is a transformational experience yeah like yeah. i'm he's getting some therapy out of it he's working <laughs> through some problems here which kind of blows blows my mind that people would use this he kind of makes sense I don't know, because you get if you tap into fear. I mean, fear drives a lot of people. To, fear is what tells you not to do things. Even not just like fear, like horror fear, but just the existential fear, things like that. Yeah. And I know he even kind of early on in the documentary. It's not really a spoiler. He talks about how he's kind of lost. He lost. He had lost his job, and he didn't really have much direction and stuff. And he so he uses these experiences as kind of a tool to work through something. Um, I think he could have just gone to therapy if he wanted it to. Probably would have been a little easier versus Well, that's the thing about it for me is is there's something else that especially these two are getting out of this experience that maybe they don't want to speak to because it could be controversial because again there there is this sexual yes undertone to this mm -hmm. and it's really rampant through all their experiences is the, the sexual I mean, they make you get naked and humiliate you. And obviously there's some people that are into that and they like that sort of thing. And so this kind of plays into that. But then it also has this this fear and, and violence in it at the same time. Um, and so there's obviously people that enjoy that for whatever reason and or they have a kink or something like that. Yeah. So I think that's part of it, especially for these two, that there's something sexual they're getting out of it. That, Absolutely. Um, they're not able to get otherwise especially russell because just because how invested he is in this experience um the other thing i will say too that i think makes this a little bit different than mckamey manor is that the actors are very much they know everything about you yeah yeah true like they they make you especially these guys that go through it multiple times they make you like fill out huge questionnaires like they really like almost do like full background checks on you i know like, the um if your if your social medias are public they'll scour through your social medias i heard that too they like figure out who your family is they figure out like obviously they eventually know where you live when yeah. they do that home experience so they they know like everything about you and oftentimes they know your deepest darkest secrets as well and so they use that to curate this experience for you and they're talking to you the whole time and you know i think in the seasonal haunts maybe not quite as much because there's more people going through but for these in invite only sort of deals with one person at a time it's very very like they they know how to get to that inner sanctum and completely obliterate it and yeah. and expose everything and make you in which i could see how if they're depending on what it was there's certain things that maybe you fears that you had or things that you were trying to get over like maybe how they could like scare that out of you yeah so right. to speak <laughs> like to get you to like face those fears head on like there's this whole theory of like facing your fears right yes and yeah like one of the ways is just do it and then you're not scared of it anymore so right. immersion therapy immersion yeah. therapies yeah exactly so that's kind of what they're doing as well as immersion therapy yeah. i guess if there was a therapy it's going on here. of it yeah and i mean to, if if we go with that too with therapy it's like about becoming vulnerable right just yeah just telling things Submitting. about yourself yeah that, yeah so like it's it, the parallels are there for sure with with uh the 
personalized blackout experience and therapy. Some people use it a bit, they kind of abuse it, which you'll see in the documentary how it gets to a point where it's just like, where do we go from here? But it's like also like a, a, a traditional therapy. You're not getting waterboarded. <laughs> you're not getting tied down, you know? Yeah. It's, it adds these weird elements to it where I think you're on board with that where it is kind of a kink. You're getting something sexual out of it. I agree with that. Also, they touch on in the documentary, the survivors, which oh, we can't really find any trace of I them I looked now. everywhere for yeah. them on Facebook. So they used to be a Facebook group. I don't know if they still exist. Maybe it's similar to the blackout experience where it's very private, possibly an invite only. You can't even search for it. I have no idea. Um, but it's essentially these few dozen people who have gone through the personalized experiences and they call themselves the survivors and they have these like little help group meetings, I guess to add to the therapy it's mm -hmm. like they all get together and talk about it and supposedly russell and chris have also met with some of the hardcore fans before um like at a bar or something and talked about the experience but then even russell has admitted he's like i leave after a little bit and just let them hang out with each other because i don't think he wants to give up the illusion so much it's kind of like meeting the author of your favorite book and right. getting to like talk to them, pick their brains about it. I think he wants to shy away from that and not give up too Keep much. Keep the fantasy alive. Yeah, exactly. So to speak, yeah. you know? So in 2017 and 2018, Blackout incorporated their extreme theater event into the Overlook Film Festival in Oregon. And it took place in one of the hotel rooms in the Timberline Lodge in Mount Hood, Oregon. The Timberline Hotel is actually where they filmed the outside of the Overlook Hotel for one of the best movies, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, and by 2017, it already had its fair share of ghost stories. Alex Riviello on SlashFilm.com gave a walkthrough of his experience. So during the film festival, Alex said that guests were basically snowed in the day before. So Alex was already on edge before the blackout experiment even began. He had been chosen to get a private session of the blackout experience set up in the hotel. He was sent a cryptic email that read, Please show up at your designated time to the Ram's Head Bar on the third floor of the Timberland Lodge. There will be someone waiting for you. They'll be wearing an old white suit and carrying a black notebook. Come at the exact scheduled time. Do not come one minute early. Do not come one minute late. Do not come to the area beforehand and quote unquote scope it out. If we see you doing so, and we will see you, we will know you don't follow instructions and the experience will be over and you will forfeit your ticket. If you are late, you will forfeit your ticket. So come on time, precisely on time. After being on edge all morning, he went to the bar exactly when they told him to be there. And that's when he noticed a man in a rumpled white suit carrying a black notebook sitting in a nearby booth. As he sat down, the stranger handed over a waiver to sign and gave him the safety word that would stop the experience at any moment. For all Alex knew, the experience had already begun. The man in the suit then placed a pair of noise-canceling headphones on Alex's head. Alex tried to listen to the quiet voice that was speaking, but it was hard to hear. Then the stranger took Alex's hands in his and he pressed their heads together. He then pulled out a vial of oil and began rubbing it on his hands. Then he rubbed it on Alex's neck while still pressing their heads together. By this point, Alex began laughing nervously. Other patrons in the bar also noticed a strange interaction. But even though it was borderline funny, Alex admitted it was a great way to unsettle him in a public space. Then the man reached for his throat and started choking him, just a little, but it was enough to make him worried. The pressure of his hand increased little by little until he eventually shoved an envelope into Alex's hands and ripped the headphones off his ears. He told him to leave the bar as fast as possible and follow the instructions inside the envelope. This is what the instructions read. 1. Go to room number 107. Use the provided key to enter the room. Take off your shoes and socks and leave them on the floor at the foot of the bed. Place the key on the bedside table. 5. There were two lamps on. Turn them both off. 6. Crawl into the bed under the covers. 7. Go to sleep. Failure to follow these instructions will result in your immediate removal. Alex found the door and stood outside, wondering what horrors he'd find inside. But after unlocking the door with a large brass key, he entered the bedroom. 
Upon entering, he was expecting someone or something to burst out, but nothing happened. It was dark and foggy, like someone had left a humidifier on. Only two lamps on either side of the bed shed light in the room. Static blared from a radio on the nightstand. All the windows were blacked out and he began thinking something was happening in the closet and the bathroom behind closed doors. But he remembered to follow the instructions as written. He took off his shoes and socks and left them at the foot of the bed. He placed the key on the nightstand and then turned the lights off. After getting into bed underneath the covers, the static from the radio shut off. Since the old hotel had creaky floors, he could hear strangers moving inside the hotel room. One was in the closet, the other in the bathroom. And when the two figures entered the room, they stood on either side of the bed. They were both dressed in black. Then both figures climbed into bed with him and started snuggling. They were breathing heavier and heavier as they got up close to him before they threw the sheets to the side and shoved the pillow over his head. After smothering him for a moment, they forced him out of bed and shoved him into the bathroom, which had a dim red light on. They covered his eyes and shoved him into the corner. One of them ordered him to stay exactly where he was, staring into the corner. Then one said, Do not say a word until she asks you. Then both figures left the hotel room. Alex stood in the bathroom staring at the wall. And that's when he heard moans and the sound of chains coming from the bathtub beside him. But he remembered his orders, and he stayed standing in the corner. He then heard a woman crying louder and louder, and eventually he felt someone tugging on his leg. He turned to see a woman crawling on the floor in her underwear with a hood over her head and manacles around her wrists. Behind her, he saw blood red writing on the wall that said, Remove her hood. As he pulled it off, he saw the woman was wide-eyed and frantic. She then lunged to the toilet bowl just beside Alex and vomited. She then screamed, I need my medicine. When Alex looked into the bathtub, he saw piles of orange prescription bottles. He started rummaging through them looking for the woman's medicine, but they were all empty. By now, the strange woman was lying on her back coughing and screaming. He even began piling the empty pill bottles in the sink to separate them from the others. After what felt like an eternity, he finally found one of the pill bottles holding a single pill. He retrieved it and placed it in the woman's mouth. She coughed and gagged a few times, but eventually seemed better. She thanked him and asked him his name. As he told her Alex, she lifted her hands that were still bound together. It looked like they were locked with a padlock, and she asked him to find the key. And that's when she pointed towards the toilet, and Alex realized he had to search the toilet bowl that she had just vomited in. Luckily, Alex wasn't a germaphobe. When he reached his hand inside, there was a chunky mixture of, hopefully, fake vomit. And sure enough, a key rested at the bottom of the bowl. After pulling it out, he unlocked her chains. But after this, things got much weirder. The woman began thanking him over and over again. And she began tugging at his clothes, lifting off his shirt and grabbing at his belt. He tried guarding himself, but she was too persistent. Before he knew it, he was down to his underwear. She then tried to give him a drink in a strange medicine cup. Luckily, it was just water. But one after the next, she kept forcing him to drink more and more water. They were interrupted by a loud banging noise in the distance. As they both peeked out of the bathroom, there was no one there. She then led him to the hotel room door, and after checking the hallway, still, there was no one there. So she led him to the bed, laid him down, and pulled him down with her. And Alex had to come to terms with the fact that he was a married man, now lying in bed in his underwear, next to a strange woman who was also in her underwear. As his heart was racing, she started asking questions like what fear was, and he answered, the unknown, which he later admitted was nonsense. She then asked him what he was most afraid of, and Alex laughed. When she asked why he was laughing, he responded that he laughed when he was nervous. She then asked if he trusted her. After a moment of hesitation, he said yes. She then pulled out straps and started tying his hands down to the bed. Once he was securely strapped down, she placed noise-canceling headphones over his ears. All he could hear was static. Suddenly, from behind the woman, out came a large man in a zippered gimp mask. He then grabbed the woman and started beating her. Alex tried to pull away from the straps that tied him to the bed, but they were too tight. The man in the gimp mask looked over at him for a moment, and in that moment of silence, it felt like a threat. The large man then returned to the woman and continued beating her until she stopped moving. He dragged her across the room and dumped her on the couch. The man then came over to Alex and straddled him. 
After taking off the gimp mask, he then put the mask over Alex's head and returned the headphones over his ears. He could barely see anything through the eye slits. And now the headphones began blaring, Puff the Magic Dragon. The strange man then stripped off all of his clothes and simulated sexual assault on the woman. At some point, she crawled over to the bed and tried to grab Alex's arm for help, but he was still tied to the bed. After the man finished with the woman, he jumped back on top of Alex and started pushing down on his chest while staring directly into his eyes. He then shifted the mask on Alex's heads until he could barely see through one of the holes, covering his face, possibly a mouth hole. The man then untied Alex's arms, dragged him off the bed, and pushed him towards the door. Alex thought he was about to get pushed out into the hallway and forced to run around in a gimp mask in his underwear, but luckily that didn't happen. Another man appeared and they began dressing Alex as fast as they could. One of the men then whispered in Alex's ear, You will think of this every time you're in the dark. Then they shoved him out of the hotel room door and ordered him to run. He stumbled down the hall while still fixing his pants and shirt. Alex later wrote, it was insane, exhilarating, and absolutely an amazing experience. In all my years, I perhaps became numb to the scare of horror movies, but I'd never take one for granted ever again. Hours later, headed to one of the hotel bars for dinner when he saw another bewildered looking man stumbling down the stairs with a familiar envelope in his hand. All Alex told him was, good luck. After the 2019 season it looks like blackout has ended, the website and social media pages do still exist, and there are hopes that the extreme haunt will return someday. But as of now, it is not currently operating. This Lights Out episode is sponsored by Embrace Pet Insurance. If you're like me, and you are insufferable about how much you love your dog or your pet, uh, you just got to have insurance for it. I will just admit, I love my dog, Jerry more than most things in this world and in this universe. And since that's the case, I need insurance for my dog. I would not go a day without it. I've had scares before with Jerry. They thought she had a UTI. They thought maybe she was spayed too early. She was having some urinary problems. We didn't know what it was exactly, but we got it figured out. Unfortunately, I had to take her to back and forth to the vet, I think three or four times in the matter of a few months. But luckily I had that pet insurance that really covered the cost. It's time to upgrade your pet insurance game. Whether you have a dog or a cat, Embrace Pet Insurance offers customized plans for your pet's exact needs. Unfortunately, vet care prices have increased a significant amount even just in the past year. It's up about 33% and that's just crazy. So these days you just gotta have that pet insurance. And if you have multiple pets to insure, you're eligible for a 10% multi-pet discount. Plus they have a 24 seven helpline and optional wellness rewards programs to ensure you prioritize preventative care for your pet. So you hopefully never even need to use Embrace in the first place. Before I got pet insurance, I was also super skeptical about it. I thought it was maybe too expensive. I thought it would never come in handy. Jerry is a very healthy dog. I've never had problems with her before. But it turns out I ended up needing it, and you might need it too. So don't wait for the unexpected to happen. Join the massive community of pet owners who trust Embrace Pet Insurance to protect their pet. Head to EmbracePetInsurance.com slash lights out and sign up for pet insurance today. Make sure you go to EmbracePetInsurance.com slash lights out or else they won't know I sent you. That's EmbracePetInsurance.com slash lights out. I love how when he gets forced into the bed, he's like, oh God, I'm a married man. And there's this woman next to me. Well, little did he know they kind of, you know, as they say, subverted his expectations. And it turns out it was the huge man in the gimp mask that came and struck right. him instead. Very intense experience though. Yeah. I think of the pill bottle thing would have been really intense too. Cause he talks about how she's just incessantly screaming in this bathroom, which is stressful. And you're, looking for a tiny pill and one pill bottle that's among dozens. It seems like a dozen. theme that they do is put you under stress to yeah. make you do things and be a part of it, of the, the actual narrative that's playing out. Yeah. And I mean, this is just his experience. So again, this is like changes up for different people. Yeah. Cause one of the things that really 
got me in the documentary that Russell had to do was it, they forced Russell to pull the trigger on a gun yeah. to a hostage kneeling on the ground. And they were like yelling at him. And, and that was one of the moments where I felt like Russell was truly like broken. And so they literally handed him a gun and they're like, they either say pull it or do it or something. And he's pointing the gun at, at this hooded figure that's kneeling on the ground. And Russell's just like crying and he's just like, but he eventually pulls the trigger. And of course, you know, there's no bullets or anything, but just pulling the trigger was enough. To, I mean, he breaks down, he like drops the gun and he like truly thought he was going to kill this person. Yeah. And I think for me, when I saw that, I was like, wow, this is very real. Like, even though it's a fake experience, it is very real when you're in it. Yeah, that's why they were talking about, like, their goal was to make you forget that you're in a safe environment. You are in a safe environment the whole time, but their goal was to get you to forget that. And I think that's, if you can curate something like that, that's pretty powerful. And that's where you get to the point of some uh, serious psychological trauma, too. Yeah. If you're putting people in that intensive situations right. to the point where they forget kind of what's going on exactly, that's immersive horror. And that stays with you yeah, for a long, long time. Now, one of the things I wanted to do, because this is where you really get a lot more understanding around the experience and what it's like for different people, is I want to read a five-star review of the Blackout Haunted House in New York from 2019. And then we'll read a negative review so you can kind of see how it's really different for everybody. Everybody responds to it differently. But this particular person's review is very interesting to me based on her history. So this is a review that was left publicly on Yelp.com by Mika K from Cleveland, Ohio on October 26, 2019, titled Blackout. I highly recommend it to everyone. It reads... I didn't know a lot about Blackout other than what I saw in glimpses on social media over the past few years. I've always loved haunts, but I couldn't bring myself to do them anymore. I've been raped and sexually assaulted, and the idea of people jumping at me or grabbing me scared the hell out of me. It's not something I thought about, but as someone whose love language is physical touch, it's something I needed to reclaim. I was so proud of my partner for going through with it and the way he described it, I knew I had to go. I bought my ticket yesterday and the anticipation killed me in the best way possible. When I arrived, I checked in with Faith up front. She immediately made me feel safe and was such a joy to talk to. And Chris, I appreciate him so, so much. I knew the questions I was going to be asked before going in, so I knew I needed to be honest about my anxiety. I just started taking medications again, and although I feel significantly better, I know what I'm off. I know when I'm off or triggered. His check-in was so reassuring and he instilled that confidence in me that I could do this and be honest with myself if I needed to stop. The actors were everything. I knew I was in safe hands the entire time. Their generosity of vulnerability and control and their ability to read my body and what I needed in the moment was incredible. I was terrified and amused and happy among a shit ton of other feelings and ultimately I knew I was safe and fuck, it felt so good to scream. I'm very grateful for what this experience provided for me. I know I have a lot of healing to do when it comes to trust and understanding physical touch and different types of relationships, but this experience proved to me that it's something I don't have to be afraid of. It is something I need and I can embrace. And if I'm ever afraid, I'm in control. It also made me so excited for rewrites on my musical Maxa. My ultimate goal for the piece is to make it accessible to survivors like myself and leave the ending in a way that may not be satisfying for everyone, but at the very least cathartic. I felt so much relief and dread when I finished it because I was deep in the pits of my depression at the time. Blackout inspired the hell out of me, and I can't wait to dive back in. To their company, thank you for everything. I didn't know this was something I needed, and I'm so grateful for the experience. If you're curious about it, I couldn't recommend it more. Go, 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 before they close. Wow. Yeah, and that's, I mean, they from also, a they, sexual assault survivor, I mean, that's pretty uh, incredible to read. Yeah, and I know um, Josh Randall had talked about, like, if you can learn something about yourself and take something positive away from it, that's also one of their goals. So it sounds like mission accomplished with, with that uh, reviewer. Um, 
I noticed a lot of the bad reviews come from the seasonal Halloween ones. And I've heard that before. I think some people maybe expect that they're going into the personalized hyper curated ones when mm. they're not realizing they're just doing the Halloween ones, which I hear are much more tame yeah. than the personalized ones. Um, but I'll read one here. So here's October 24th, 2012. So obviously the Halloween season. Curtis B. and they did the New York show. This isn't scary. It's just a cock fest. Located in Chelsea, it makes a lot of sense. They should have just saved the money on the space and have it at a gay bar. Seems a bit homophobic. A naked dude will make you dance with him as he holds a music box to your ear. Another put a bag over my head and basically just tried to make out with me. I was also chained up and a dude acted like he was going to rape me if I didn't scream. When I didn't scream or did a mock scream, he said he was going to kick me out and tell everyone out front that I called safety in the first round. Then he put me in timeout for not screaming. What a joke. Which, come on, you're supposed to follow the orders, right? That was one of the rules. So there were other gross but not necessarily scary situations as well. There was a little girl pretending to shit blood into a bucket that makes you touch whatever is in there. There's another girl sucking on a condom, a girl with no teeth that hands you pliers, and a girl in a room with airplane noises playing that hands you some wet thing with hair on it then pretends to puke on you. The scenarios are mostly just molestations that would only scare someone that has been sexually assaulted. Thankfully, I didn't pay for this because my friend had an extra ticket. I had no idea what I was going into. Uh, I, that sounds like maybe, I don't know. It's valid, but also sounds like maybe, he, yeah, he didn't know what he was going into. So I think that's kind of the problem. Maybe he thought it yeah. was more of a, like it was supposed to be a more traditional haunted house. Well, and just like kind of glancing through like most of the negative reviews, they all come around that Halloween seasonal time. And the number one thing is like, I was not scared. It was just disgusting, and gross. And, yep. and they felt like they were underserved during this experience. Mm -hmm. So I, I think a lot of these people are just are very confused that they thought they were going for the, you know, the full shebang, yeah. uh, full fully curated experience. And instead they all kind of got the same sort of experience out of it a lot of the same scenes and things like that each year um and so a lot of them were just like it was disgusting and it smelled like shit <laughs> one dude was like well at least there's one room where a hot girl was grinding on me chewing on a condom <laughs> and i knew it was fake i think i think that was the issue is a lot of people felt like it just felt fake yeah yeah and um, not real enough mm -hmm. and so also, I feel like the people that are seeking out Blackout probably have watched McKamey Manor. And so they're comparing McKamey Manor to this experience. And so when they go through, they're expecting they're like, that wasn't that intense. They're like, oh, what the hell? I wasn't locked in a coffin and fed cockroaches. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> what's going on? And again, it's it's very it's 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 that sadomasochism. It's like mm -hmm. it's very much that like dark kind of sexual. It's it's not really really i think people are confused at what the experience is and what it skews towards even though it seems like a lot of them did watch like some of the youtube stuff and they just were just annoyed by it but yeah a lot of negative reviews on yeah. on, on blackout experience and some positive ones which it's weird that for all these people that had a negative experience the one that has the positive experience is you know a you know domestic violence survivor or sexual assault survivor it's it's crazy to think that's that, pretty huge. It like, is. And I would say, I don't know if I was the creator, I would just say that, that it's reviews like that that would keep me going, if anything. Like if it's a, actually helping people, that's, uh, I guess, all you can really ask for. Yeah. But that's the thing, too, is like you have to really dig for the personalized, like the really custom personalized experience. And that's why that documentary, because the people in the survivors group are the ones that had the invite only off season experiences. And it's really hard to find what those people went through. I mean, we, we dug really hard to find what they went through. And the only things we could find were Russell and um, the I other Bob, Bob yeah. from uh, the documentary. But I think, I think a lot of people are just pissed because they want that experience. They want that like one-on-one, -on -one, you know, the, the real customized yeah. invite only experience. And, 
they're disappointed by the Halloween version of Blackout. Yeah, um, and it, it's, I mean, and they could have they could have eventually gotten an invite if they stuck with it, but I don't think you're going to get an invite if you throw up a one star review on Yelp. You're never going to have the chance no, to get the, no. the serious shit. I want to ask you, Danny, what are what are your thoughts on on Blackout, and would you ever partake in it? You know, after first hearing about it, I had a hard no uh, because when I mean, when I was first told about it, I was just told that it was basically a sexual McKinney Manor, and knowing how crazy McKinney Manor was and the abuse that people went through, it really turned me off to the idea. But I mean, after watching the documentary and like learning more about it and the experiences people go through, I'd be willing to try blackout and not just like the halloween basic version I'd, I'd be willing to try the curated version um knowing that i'm in a safe uh space like I'm, I'm in a safe environment with the actors that actually care about my safety would help me a lot going into it um but i know that during it i would have to like suspend my belief and t- and not constantly think about how i'm safe how i'm safe how i'm safe i would have to put myself into it and give my give in a little bit to experience it and i think that's what a lot of these people with the one star reviews just refuse to do yeah they refuse to like give in and just experience it and like we were saying about the other haunted houses just have fun experience it right i was it makes me think of like the one we went to on friday it's we went into it, it you know expecting to have fun and be be fun along with it if you go into it with an attitude of like mm. I bet no one's going to scare me. Yeah, you're probably not going to get scared. Yeah. And like I like how Daniel brought up the suspension of disbelief. That's I think that's a big part of it in horror in general, whether mm-hmm. you're talking about movies, totally. haunted houses, yeah, whatever. It's mindset. Uh yeah, it totally is your mindset. You're not going to get scared if if you don't think you're going to get scared and you put yourself into that. But I I agree though. I would do it. Uh I would this this I'll just admit. I would do the at home curated break-in shit yeah wow i I think that would be you want to be waterboarded naked in your bathtub you know (laughs) it's a dream of mine (laughs) no it's like i think the other thing about it is that since the creators know that other people know i don't necessarily know if they're gonna come in and waterboard me i think the fun of the home invasion you have no idea what you're getting into i don't know if they're gonna strip me naked put me in the bathroom i don't like i don't are they gonna take me to the kitchen throw me in the oven i've no like i, <laughs> I, I just I, stuff you like a turkey yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> put an apple in my mouth yeah like i have no idea what they're gonna do and i think that is the allure it's the mystery it's the not knowing what you're getting into uh which also i know they tried to they're saying like we wanted to move away from the traditional haunt but in a way that is very much like a traditional haunted house because like I was saying earlier, we're we're trying to get the Mile Higher Media team to go to this haunted house yeah. in Denver. And there's been some pushback from some <laughs> people I won't name, yeah. I won't shame you. But really it's it's the psyching yourself yes. out beforehand is like kind of the scariest part the anxiety you get and like when you show up and you start seeing what you're about to go into it starts hyping it up and you hear people screaming inside yeah like that's a part of the horror experience you're kind of once you're in line that's it's kind of begun and i think that the home invasion part kind of adds to that because you're like okay okay where the fuck do i go it's october 16th where like are they are they gonna knock in the door are they gonna come in through the back uh what's going to happen. You know, it's kind of like psyching yourself out beforehand. It's kind of a part of the experience. So I like that. Well, the, the home, the home experience is, is definitely the most extreme that blackout gets. And it's most similar to what Russ does with McCamey Manor. I mean, they like kidnap your ass <laughs> in McCamey Manor, like fucking they come and get you and uh, throw you in a van and do the whole shebang, you know, come get you from your house type of thing. And I think that, I do think there is, it it can be hard for people to allow their minds to go to that place of, of immersion. And I think, like, I think Danny said, like the one star reviews are people who refuse to like, let themselves get in the right mind state. Like they went in there like, oh, this is going to be crazy. And then they like, they just fought it the whole time. Yeah. It's the way that I kind of describe the haunt experience is kind of like a psychedelic trip with psychedelics. If you really want to get 
the most out of it, you got to like let yourself go. You've got to completely submit to, you know, the substance and let it take your mind where it wants to go. Hopefully it goes to a good place. Same thing with, with horror and haunts is like, if you fight it and you're like, I don't want to be scared. I don't want to feel that fear. You can, especially with a haunt, you can tell yourself, this is fake. This is, I'm going to be safe. There's a safety word. And I think for me, because I'm just so mentally, I, I, I would be able to maintain that in my mind the entire time. So I would prefer not to have the safety word if I really wanted that true experience. Because if I knew that I had an out, then that would always be in the back of my mind. And I don't know if I could be fully immersed into it. So that's where I like understand the people that do a McCamey Manor because there isn't that safety word. That's a great point because I would tell myself, you're not saying safety. I would just go into it being like, you're going to go through this and you're not going to chicken out. So yeah, I get the appeal of it as well, but I would just personally go into it and say, it doesn't matter if there's a safe word or not. You're going through it, buddy. Yeah. I would just tell myself that. And hopefully that would make the experience even better knowing just personally that I couldn't out or I would disappoint myself. Do you worry, do either of you worry that it would potentially awaken something in me? <laughs> Either awaken something <laughs> deep, deep within you or traumatize you in a way that could potentially affect Be you bad. later on or could affect your relationships personally going forward? Because that's like one thing that's I think about question. is these guys that are going through it, you know, a lot of people go through it who are in healthy relationships, are married, have significant others and I just wonder if if it's real enough, could it affect you mentally? Like, I think that's the question. And it'd be interesting to hear like a psychologist's perspective on these types of experiences is like, yeah, you're you're tricking your mind into thinking this is real and you're having this experience, but is there lingering effects? And I think that I think yes and no could be the same way that you watch horror movies and potentially you have nightmares as a result. Is it that same kind of thing? Or sometimes you watch horror movies and it doesn't affect you at all. Yeah. And a lot of people aren't affected by horror yeah. in you know a more traumatic way. I think that's a great question. And I think a part of it is because I don't get scared at horror movies anymore. I'll get scared at horror video games. That's like the one immersive experience that I can have some level of fear towards. And the reason I would do the at-home ex- experience is just kind of tapping into that. I kind of miss the... As weird as it sounds, I kind of miss that old feeling of fear uh, that I used to get when I was a kid. Like when I first watched Jaws, I was probably like 11 or 12 or something. Terrified me, traumatized me. But in hindsight, I kind of like miss that. Yeah. And I kind of want to get get back to that space. And I'm wondering if this experience could get me there. And as far as the, um, if it would traumatize me permanently, I think I have enough faith in the creators that they wouldn't do something that would uh, like permanently damage me. Obviously I would, they want the experience to stick with me and haunt, haunt me for a while. I don't think they would go as so far to like do something so disturbing that I, I can't return. I'm changed permanently Mm -hmm. after that. And I think a lot of the, the guys that we watch in the documentary are, a little bit more extreme cases they're they're following the people that are getting some weird yeah like extreme take on it and i don't think i would have that reaction to it i don't think maybe i'm just not that type of person or i don't think i would do it more than once too these guys are doing it like multiple multiple right right i would probably just be a one and done and that would be it because yeah the one guy is his wife's talking like you can do it as long as it doesn't become like a consistent, what is she just like, you have to moderate it or something yeah. like keep it under wraps. That's why it's a therapist too. Under control. Which yeah. is so bizarre. <laughs> Isn't that wild? That she's like down for this. Yeah. What about you, Daniel? Do you feel like it would affect you in any way or do you are you able to kind of like block things out? And I mean, I can, I'm pretty good at blocking things out, but because of the mystery behind it, I don't know if I'll be, right, able, that's to, how I feel. be able to block it out or yeah. not. Um, in regards to the safe word, I'm happy it's there, but I'm with Austin on that. I would, I would kind of like make it 
not exist in my mind. I would just yeah. block out the safe word and be like, that doesn't exist for you. It, ex it exists for other people, but it, it doesn't exist for you. And I would just try and go through it. Um, I'm trying to think of something that I could, that I could see or experience that would genuinely give me, I guess, PTSD. And I'm, I'm not really sure. I think, I think with, with the suspension of belief, I would be able to maintain the fact that it is fake, but I would also be able to experience it and have fun with kind of like hallucinogens. Like you, you, you see these things when you're on hallucinogens and they are very real in mm -hmm. that moment. But in the back of your head, you're like, it's, it's not real. It's just, you know, this drug, it's just this drug, right. it's just this experience. It's not real, but it is real. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. No, well, that's exactly how it is. I think, and I think this is where the lines are drawn between McKamey Manor and what Russ is doing versus Blackout and Josh and Chris are doing. I think Josh and Chris know. They seem very intelligent. They seem like they understand. You know, they put a lot of thought into this to make sure that they don't create something that crosses a line and, and does, you know, affect people long term in, in a serious way. Although I will say there there have been people who have had, uh, actually I think Russell in the documentary says he's had like back pain as a result of this oh, and really? stuff like lingering chronic pain and so, so like there's definitely there's definitely a physical element to it it's just not to the level that russ takes it uh, and it's definitely more psychological and i think that's the the really interesting thing we all have seen so much like put somebody through the, the blackout experience who's never seen a horror film before they are going to have terrible time yeah probably a traumatic experience i mean that's yeah. going to be ptsd for them versus the typical people that seek this experience out are horror fans and are people who engage in this type of of dark content on a regular basis and have, are desensitized to it. True. So I think that's like a huge thing to it as well as like what you've been exposed to prior to this and psychologically and what you see through your eyes is totally different from the physical part of it. And I think that's where McKamey Manor, they went the other way. They went like, we're going to physically fuck you up. <laughs> and in the process, you'll be psychologically fucked up because you're going to feel pain. You are going to feel like you're going to fucking die mm -hmm. in this. And I think it's the physical part that has to connect with the psychological part to create that true sense of fear in somebody. That like, is very true, yeah. Because psychologically, our brains are so powerful that we're able to pinpoint and we're able to discern that this is fake this is not fake and as long as i'm not my body's not in physical pain which i think you are throughout it you feel some pain and you feel but they just do it and it seems like they do it in spurts and then they let off and then you do it in spurts so it's not like because they, they kind of go that way you're able to be like okay he's gonna stop you know and i'm gonna be fine and your your brain's able to kind of walk you through the experience but in mckamey manner you're physically put through the ringer and i think that is why people seek it out is because it is as close to real fear as you can possibly get is yeah. it ethical that's the other question yeah well it makes me think of like pow's and, right. and people who have actually been tortured and stuff uh yeah physical abuse it, it's the fastest and easiest way to get someone to break right it's right. just physically abusing the shit out of them because that plays into the psychological torture um but yeah i mean you think of guantanamo bay you think of just all the things throughout history uh yeah it's it it's it's the easiest fastest way to certainly break somebody it's physical pain i know for me it would take that physical torture to to feel that shaking fear the fear of like to elicit that fight or flight response of like i'm gonna fucking die yeah if i don't get out of this situation what about like i don't know if you put me in a room for for 48 hours playing wheels on the bus go round and round oh just come you, over to my house you, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. i can make that happen that's, good. that's so true <laughs> shit okay i take it back my kid I, listens to the to same it. same fucking youtube videos every day <laughs> yeah. so you're you're numb to that experience i guess so you've You've mentally fortified yourself. Do you think you can mentally fortify yourself against pain? I think you do. I think you have to, to survive. I think eventually you figure out how to just survive at that point. Yeah. Some people do, some don't though. I think that's, it just comes down to the person. Some people are able to 
fortify themselves and survive the situation as many people survive war violent crime i mean you you name it people have survived it yeah but then there's people who can't and yeah. you know succumb to their wounds and to the to the to the violence and so i think that's where that's the true fear experiences right there is when you're listening that fight or flight response i think in blackout i think you get tastes of that but i think the in the way that they do it they don't push it to the point where it is going to affect you you know for years to come yeah, you know what i mean you're I able to just to discern that this is just a uh it's simulated like a staged experience play, yeah so which is why i would do the in-house experience knowing that i have faith in the creators and they seem like you know just i don't i can't get a, a true gauge on them but they don't feel like they're in this for any malicious intent whereas russ does not seem like a guy who's in it for something good i mean the guy just looks sick <laughs> yeah. i mean he he's clearly just fucking off his rocker and you know we'll dive into that here yeah i'm excited in, in a week or two that. yeah but yeah blackout man it's a very interesting experience i'll i wonder if it'll come back and I'm surprised there's not more of these things popping up i know there's there's a few out there but you know if there's any out there that any of you have gone through let us know because i do find these extreme haunts as they're called very intriguing and it's interesting to kind of look at the different experiences people have i do i do wonder though the actors that do this i'm like and do this like year after year after year especially the actors that work for us i'm like is this like encouraging criminal behavior or is this in just acting in so, the actors you're saying yeah like yeah. is it or is it like are you kind of you're like letting the dog off the leash so yeah to speak. it's like is it a good thing to be simulating sexual assault for people like morally <laughs> probably not <laughs> that's a fair question but at the end of the day people are consenting to this experience the actors are consenting and this right. is a fake it's simulated so it's not it's not real as far as sexual you know. assault yeah but i there i do feel like it there's a there's a Gray, it's a gray area, area there yeah. that's like uh, i don't know i mean it depends on who you ask and what your moral principles are but morally it seems like especially because it's immersive i think you know obviously sexual assault and things like this are portrayed in you know a, a lot of different right. art forms uh but yeah the fact that this is immersive and it's kind of actively happening and you can it's it's not there but it is there it's a lot closer than other mediums can take it to so it's definitely a gray area i would say it's fine personally i think it's these both these people have consented to this experience well it's uh, theater the yeah day, I mean. right and so i think it's as long as it's, it's consensual and you know they you i think morally if you're going to do this you got to have an out yeah there the safety word i think is a must for any type of situation like this yeah. and and i think that's why compared to others these guys do it do it right whereas <laughs> god damn yeah our boy russ man he's uh he's on another level so we should I'm, send some of the mile higher crew through blackout if it ever comes i want to send danny through black or uh blackout and then mccamey manor back to back how much would i have to pay you to go through mccamey manor you do it for money my legal fees because <laughs> <laughs> i'd to... fucking swing <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> yeah, russ, if russ start... wants to make me beg for my life i'm just gonna start swinging <laughs> i mean in blackout dude they do um they do like suffocation stuff and yeah. things like that like I, a lot of those bad reviews out, i think a lot of the bad reviews were the plastic bags over the head people didn't like Fuck that. that like <laughs> that see and there is there is enough physical that i think you could you could definitely um experience that real fear here yeah and, and and i don't know maybe maybe i could too i've never put a plastic bag over my head and no you haven't learned how to sleep every night before bed. since i was a kid I mean, <laughs> damn the big bold letters do not let a child yeah. put this bag over your head. you're just over Danny's there like, <laughs> <laughs> well we want to know what you guys think about the blackout experience have any of you actually gone through it that'd be really interesting to hear yeah uh if anybody out there listening to this has gone through blackout we'd love to to know your thoughts and, ex, and you know details on your experience so let us know but before we go i did want to mention that we are doing a little uh 
exclusive Lights Out Low Lives video. Uh, for those of you who've joined the membership here on YouTube, we are going to be doing a little movie review on a recent horror movie that honestly plays uh, very well into this episode. And uh, also answering some some burning questions from from you guys. So if you want to take part in that and get access to that exclusive video, and you know every month we're going to try to do some some piece of exclusive content for you guys, whether it's an additional video, mini sewed, uh, potentially even a live stream, uh, definitely check out the Lights Out Low Lives fan club here on YouTube. There's a little join button. You get custom emojis. There's all sorts of cool stuff that comes along with it. And we have a private Discord, uh, which has been a ton of fun. And thank you to everybody that's joined already. We really do appreciate it. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing that crew grow as we go forward. But that is going to be it for us today. We'll see you next time for Halloween special. Going to be lit. Get ready for it. See you next time. Lights out everybody. <laughs>